Hello students and general audiences. This is a brief review of Pierre Bourdieu's theory of habitus. After I review key terms and concepts discussed in the 1979 publication of his book Distinction, a social critique of the judgment of taste, I will also review points from David Swartz's article on habit, action, and habitus. In Distinction, Bourdieu sets out to do what so many other theorists, philosophers, anthropologists, and sociologists in the 20th century have done, particularly structuralists such as Claude Lévi-Strauss, which is to assert theories of culture and cultivation over theories of naturalness. In The Savage Mind, Lévi-Strauss argues for inherent theories uh, structural similarities among all cultures, explaining the superficial differences in terms of culture and cultivation. Bourdieu wants to disprove the perceived naturalness and naturalism of taste, thereby erasing the perceived disparity among different taste cultures. I will note that Bourdieu uh, departs from structuralist theories in important ways too, which we will get into. In the theory of habit, habitus, Bourdieu writes against the collective belief that taste can be pure or barbaric, as described by Immanuel Kant in The Critique of Judgment. Kant writes that pure judgment of taste must be disinterested, uninfluenced by charm or emotion. If our judgment of a thing is tainted by emotion, then our taste is barbaric. This barbarism has often been attributed to the mass preference for having uh, popular taste. Uh, so let's, let's think of this in musical terms. Uh, Stravinsky's composition of the Rite of Spring is known for its dissonance, its dissonant chords, its uh, not necessarily pleasurable uh, tone, for the, for the ear. Uh, so my preference for uh, the, the Rite of Spring would be viewed as a pure taste because it is separate from pleasure or gratification. However, if I say that I prefer Beyonce or Lady Gaga because uh, the, the rhythm is catchy, because their music um, makes me feel powerful, or reminds me of love in some way, then that would be considered a barbaric taste, right? And uh, conversely, uh, since the, the mass preference for having popular taste has been asserted over time, conversely, the upper classes, the bourgeois, has, has been associated with this pure taste because of a supposed distancing of oneself from uh, gratification in relation to art and preferences. Kant's argument for aesthetics and taste implies that there are legitimate and illegitimate practices and preferences. Furthermore, Kant suggests, perhaps by omission, that there is a high degree of choice or consciousness in the process of aesthetic judgment. And I, I think we embrace this attitude uh, that some people simply and naturally have better taste than others. This is precisely what Bourdieu contests in his writing. He writes that taste is a product of two factors. One is upbringing and the other is education. He writes, quote, Surveys establish that all cultural practices, museum visits, concert going, reading, etc., and preferences in literature, painting, or music are closely linked to educational level, measured by qualifications or length of schooling, and social origin." End quote. The correspondence of social hierarchy with taste causes us to think of taste as a class uh, marker. In Bourdieu's words, taste, quote, classifies, and it classifies the classifier. So in the case of Beyonce, uh, that, that taste would, would, that preference would classify my taste among the popular, 
which Bourdieu tends to describe as, as illegitimate, uh, tastes that are not related to power necessarily uh, or status, and uh, it also classifies it also classifies me as a classifier, as a member of that class. Let's talk about habitus. Habitus has many parts and variables. Bourdieu calls habitus a structuring structure. He writes in a footnote that perhaps the best way to imagine habitus is disposition. If we try to understand disposition, we realize it as a process, an effect, a product, a relationship, an act, a way of being, and a force all at once. A good way to think of habitus perhaps is the process of becoming for an individual and also the product, which is me, myself, the individual. Uh, the, the disposition or habitus assumes that it was formed in particular ways. So Bourdieu insists that no habitus is formed in isolation. As a sociologist, Bourdieu is interested in the social realm of what he calls social space and the fields within that space. He theorizes that individuals do not move around in social space randomly. Again, there's, there's a relationship, there's a connection. So I do not become a dentist or a bank teller or a construction worker for no reason at all. Uh, there, there is always a, a field of development within habitus. In various fields of work, there are reasons for one worker's location in the field of fast food and another person's location in, let's say, an office, a corporate workplace. Every individual has a number of potential and probable trajectories. There are probable trajectories uh, for an individual depending on events. And Bourdieu lists as one of those events, war. This is an ex excellent example of an event that could alter the potential trajectory of, of an individual, right? And th that might change the trajectory from here on out. This is where Bourdieu's theory of choice comes in. He says that we resist forces of a field with our own inertia. He opposes what he calls a mechanical relationship. So we are not like uh, Pavlov's dogs simply salivating when the bell has been rung. Uh, we have choice. Our actions are not automatic. Habitus is an ongoing exchange between the individual and the field. However, I reiterate the, his emphasis of social origin and the structures that structure us, the individual. Bourdieu believes there's a strong correlation uh, between social position and disposition of the individual. Again, trajectory is not random. Bourdieu's concept of habitus is useful really for understanding any and all lifestyles, preferences in food, clothing, furniture, media, art, cars, all kinds of things, as well as working environment and working identity. The question that might follow is what affects or causes disposition or habitus? according to Bourdieu, he points to two variables affecting practice or action and social origin. The first variable is the influence directly exerted on us by what he calls our original conditions. This is essentially how we were shaped, how we were raised perhaps by our parents or in another environment. These are our original conditions. Second is how individual trajectory has affected our dispositions uh, and perhaps my opinions as an individual. My family introducing me to jazz music or McDonald's or graffiti or action movies affects my habitus and practices. These are the conditions of my habitus. Let's imagine that I move frequently with my parents as, as a child. My attitude and response to that trajectory changes my habitus or disposition as well. 
it matters whether I adapted and learned to make friends quickly or responded by becoming more introverted. Out of both variables, our original conditions and our responses to our trajectories, uh, out of those come a set of practices, things that we do and think. Bourdieu says that these practices amount to lifestyles. Now this is the unfair part. Bourdieu contends that lifestyles are products of habitus, which become sign systems. These systems are socially qualified as being possibly vulgar or sophisticated or constrained or liberal, for example. Uh, those sign systems are made up of our various preferences and, and taste cultures. He says that our practices generally harmonize with the other members of the same class. This is not on purpose. Uh, but we can see how we would have much in common with other individuals who may have similar social origins or dispositions. David Swartz situates Bourdieu's theory of choice in between Levi-Strauss and Jean-Paul Sartre. He departs from Levi-Strauss in his research by illustrating how the individual negotiates and sometimes even violates social norms and rules. In this way, Bourdieu really raises the power of the individual. However, he disagrees with Sartre's existential writings that there can be individual action independent from the social realm. Bourdieu thought that actions are not determined by the social, but rather influenced. Our actions are not determined, but we are pushed. Now that you have some background on the parts and workings of Bourdieu's theory, we will return to Swartz's summary findings. This is a direct quote from his article. Quote, Habitus generates perceptions, expectations, and practices that correspond to the structuring properties of earlier socialization. An individual's habitus is an active residue of his or her past that functions within the present to shape his or her perceptions, thought, and bodily comportment." End quote. You see how habitus, uh, the structuring structure, includes my past and my present. It includes how I look, what music I listen to, where I work, where my parents worked, uh, my table manners, if I would like to be living in another country someday. Habitus includes all aspects of lifestyles and components of identity. Thank you.